The broadcast of the regular meeting of the Public Health and Safety Committee will now begin. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Philippe Cunningham, and I am the chair of this committee. Welcome to the regular, regularly scheduled meeting of the Public Health and Safety Committee for September 24th, 2020. As we, as we begin, I will note for the record that this meeting has remote participation by members of the City Council and City staff as authorized under Minnesota Statute Section 13D.021 due to the declared local health emergency. At this time, I will ask the clerk to call the roll so we can verify a quorum for this oh, meeting. the agenda for that meeting? Do you have it? Okay, I'm. Can I'm we please make sure folks muted. are muted? Thank you. Councilmember Gordon. I am here. Councilmember Kano. Councilmember Ellison. Present. Councilmember Palmisano. Present. Councilmember Fletcher. Present. Councilmember Cano. Chair Cunningham. Present. There are five members present and one absent. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum and can conduct the business of this committee. Colleagues, there are seven items on today's agenda. Due to some complications today, if there's no objections, we will move um, with item number seven on the agenda, which is the Transforming Community Safety Engagement Plan outline and deliverables. When we finish with this discussion, we will return to the beginning of this agenda. At this point, I will invite Director of the Office of Violence Prevention, Sasha Cotton, from the Health Department to give that presentation. Welcome, Director Cotton. Good afternoon, Chair Cunningham. Thank you for the opportunity to present here and thank you to the committee. Um, we're here today to provide an update on the transforming community safety efforts. And I don't, oh, presentation's there, great. Um, this presentation will mostly focus on the engagement plan and some deliverable outlines. Um, we're gonna start with um, slide one, if we could go to the next slide, please. So we'll start with some grounding and context. I'm gonna start, um, with what we've done to date and then what contributions have gone towards this effort up to this point. So next slide, please. So community safety approaches have been taking place in the city of Minneapolis in a variety of ways. So additional community safety approaches that we've taken up to, to this point include policy oriented actions, staff directions, resolutions, ordinance changes, investments, other council or mayoral action and programmatic initiatives across the enterprise. So we're not starting from scratch with thinking about um, more broad strategies of public safety. Next slide, please. Community safety approaches have been, um, as I said, going on for a while. We've had policy oriented actions and some of the examples of those policies include um, dating back as far as 2006 to city council declaring youth violence a public health issue, the city has released two versions of its blueprint for action to prevent youth violence, which looks at a public health approach to violence prevention. The establishment of our Office of Violence Prevention and the city code of ordinances, which took place in late 2018. Staff directions are related to creating a 911 response work group. The conduct on licensed premise ordinance changes, um, staff directions calling for an MPD staffing study, and our problem nature code study. So again, this is just really to reiterate that this is not new on the policy front. Our city has been thinking about um, changes to public safety and community safety for some time. Next slide, please. In addition to the policy work that we've already um, talked about, there have also been programmatic initiatives that have taken place throughout the enterprise and certainly in the Office of Violence Prevention related to broadening our scope on public safety. Things like our Blueprint Approved Institute, which focuses on capacity building, our pop-up parks, which are a partnership with Parks and Rec to provide mobile parks to areas with high rates of violence, our group violence intervention, which I know we've talked about at length here, but is a, a project that's focused on um, providing people with resources to stay safe, alive, and free if they're involved in group violence, but also looking at account accountability measures um, through law enforcement. Our hospital-based work known as Next Step, Inspiring Youth, which is a youth mentorship program and that offers case management for young people that are um, on a trajectory towards the juvenile justice system potentially. The work of our Juvenile Supervision Center, which is housed in our city hall and allows us to not over-criminalize young people and to provide them with resources when they've committed low-level offenses. 
our violence prevention fund, which is in the Office of Violence Prevention, which provides grassroots organizations with funding to do their work and to reimagine some of their work to be in line with violence prevention specifically. Our mental health co-responder teams, which operate um, out of our police department, our community navigators who are doing amazing work in culturally and topically specific areas out of the police department, the Pathways to New Beginnings work, which is happening in our city attorney's office and focused on first time gun offenders. We've done domestic violence outreach for a number of years through our city attorney's office, even in animal control and uh, domestic, excuse me, animal care and domestic and control, we have a domestic violence program, which I think goes under recognized as a really important uh, way that the city provides a service to victims of domestic violence who are worried about their animals being victimized if they leave the home of their abuser. Our youth coordinating, out, our youth coordinating board outreach teams that many of us know and love who wear yellow t-shirts, and then lastly, um, Journey Forward, which is a pre-employment program out of our um, employment and training division that really focuses on high-risk individuals or those who maybe have had encounters with the criminal justice system and helping them um, reattach to meaningful work opportunities. And so this is just a highlighted list. There are countless other ways that our city is programmatically thinking about uh, violence prevention and alternatives to a peer law enforcement strategy around the issue of public safety. Um, so you can, as you can see from this slide, there's a lot of work that's happening across the enterprise programmatically. Next slide, please. So we've done a number of community engagement um, outlets that have included questions around public safety. Those include the Minneapolis 2040 Comprehensive Plan, the Strategic uh, and Racial Equity Action Plan, the Violence Prevention Steering Committee, our Promise Zone, our Police Civilian Oversight Commission, and a number of other um, entities within the city that have focused specifically on working uh, to address and ask questions around public safety of community members and trying to build on the desire of those community members to reimagine and reallocate our focus around public safety. Next slide, please. And while all of the things we've talked about have been going on, as we've said, dating back as far as 2006, we know that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done and that there's considerable room for additional growth. Uh, the Transforming Community Safety Resolution calls for additional engagement to help develop and present strategies for building this new model for cultivating community safety. So that is exactly um, why we're here. It's important that as we think about this, in an even more broad based way that we are working with our uh, constituents and residents and stakeholders across the city of Minneapolis to get their input around what they'd like to see from the city on public safety. Next slide, please. Some existing infrastructure that we've already been able to build out as we've been um, charged with some of this work is the future of community safety work group that um, came out of that resolution. There's also some tables that have been convened by the mayor that will feed into this system with um, national expert groups and local experts on the issue of community safety, violence prevention, and law enforcement. We have an existing 911 work group that has been looking at alternatives to 911 calls and trying to think about innovative ways to respond to some of those things. And so we know that that work will feed into this body of work. And then the future of community safety subcommittees that will be um, that are already operationalized and starting to meet and will continue to help feed into the conversation, planning and recommendations for this body of work. Next slide, please. So engagement, um, the principles and areas of focus, outcomes and challenges. We're um, really going to focus in the next segment on some of the process pieces um, as we think about this work moving forward. Next slide, please. So we really want to anchor our approach in accessibility, meaningful and, inclu and inclusivity. Um, so meaningful engagement and in inclusivity. So our engagement opportunities will be varied and designed to be accessible and meet people where they are. We want the experiences to be meaningful. The community feels that the dialogues um, have to be meaningful and relevant and that they inform action and that their contributions are reflected in the recommendations for a new system of public safety. It's also really important that they're inclusive. Engagement opportunities will need to reach the full diversity of our city, center the voices of BIPOC communities and immigrant communities, victims of harm, and others who have been historically marginalized or underserved by present systems. Next slide, please. 
and our engagement will seek input on a couple of areas. Uh, primarily, we'll be looking at alternatives to policing and police response. And like I said, some of that work has already started through our 911 um, alternatives work group. We'll also be looking at um, public health oriented violence prevention strategies. And while I don't necessarily think it's secondary, we know that the law enforcement reform and changes to protocols and practices is work that our mayor's office has already been doing. They will continue to lead as a part of this process on some of the engagement efforts and changes to the police department. Um, in addition, the Minnesota Department of Human Rights also plans engagement for their patterns and practices of racial discrimination lawsuits to inform changes to existing law enforcement systems. So all of these things will be um, looked at and core functions of the work group as we move forward and think about um, questions and ways to engage the community on these subjects. Next, next slide, please. So the Transforming Community Safety Resolution adopted by Council on June 12th of 2020 calls for recommendations building on a new model for cultivating safety and engagement, along with research into local and national evidence-based practice, practice-based evidence, and community wisdom practices will all inform the requested recommendations. As you can see, the recommendations will be framed around the language that has already been outlined in the resolution. This will help provide some structure to help ensure that any products um, that we create are within the scope of the city council and its responsibilities. So we're looking at some immediate policy change and investments and partnerships that could center a public health approach to community safety and support alternatives to policing. We're also looking at research and engagement to inform the potential creation of a new city department of community safety with a holistic approach to community safety, including a review and analysis of relevant existing models and programs and practices that could be applied it's important to note that staff will focus on presenting information to inform these decisions, not specific recommendations about a proposed department structure. Uh, the next set will be recommendations that advance the work of the 911 work group and other strategies for transitioning work of the Minneapolis Police Department to alternatives that may be more appropriate responses based on community requests for help and identifying the resources needed to perform this work in the city's various departments other agencies and or community partners while the work of creating a new public safety system is in progress. Uh, our last set of recommendations will be for additional community safety strategies that build upon existing work across our city enterprise that approach public safety through a public health lens. Next slide, please. We anticipate that there will be some natural challenges, uh, one of them being the pandemic that we're unfortunately experiencing right now. We know that it will limit our ability to do engagement the way that we normally think about it, which would be to get out into community, have meetings in person, be able to commune over food and uh, really dig into some of these uh, important subject matters. However, we do feel like using virtual settings like the one we're using right now, um, people have become accustomed to and will certainly be a methodology of engagement until it is safe to do in, pub in person uh, engagements or until we conclude the process. Uh, we also imagine that pace and expectations may also be a challenge. Um, you know, the situation we find ourselves in does trigger some people for many a desire to address recent and acute trauma um, as long, along with historical trauma may drive a sense of urgency to act right now and to get involved. And we know that many community members want to have an opportunity to in, involve themselves, to give input, and that's why we're, we're trying to get the process started. But we also recognize that for others, those same traumas may drive a lack of desire or a lack of readiness to engage with systems that they feel have played a role in creating and perpetuating those traumas. So we're going to have to balance our approach and make sure that, uh, again, we're meeting people where they're at as it pertains to engagement. Next slide, please. So engagement plan and deliverable outcomes will be the next set of subject matter we'll cover in this presentation. Next slide. So for phase one, we'll be focused on information gathering and this should start in October. Um, the purpose of this will be to provide a baseline, contextual, baseline of contextual information on existing efforts, statutory requirements, and best practices. We'll conduct initial engagement to capture input on the current models of community safety, opportunities for changes, and ideas to be included in a new model. We think it's really important in addition to asking people what they want to provide as we set a baseline of information because we recognize that community may not know about 
national best practices and other opportunities um, to look at. And so we'll be providing a baseline as well as asking some questions. Um, the strategies that we'll use will be community surveys, community forums that would include multi ward sessions, as well as working with established groups that reflect the diversity of our city. Um, additional strategies would be to promote accessibility as suggested by engagement experts. So we'll be working with people um, on engagement across the enterprise to make sure that we're creating modalities that work well um, for the broadest base of people in our city as possible. The deliverables from this phase will be a preliminary synthesis of the initial themes for engagement to be reported back to Council um, early in December. We imagine that we'll be able to draft vision and goal statements for consideration and at an adoption by our policymakers. Next slide, please. Phase two will be reflection and the drafting of some recommendations. The purpose is re-engaging community to confirm that phase one and our preliminary synthesis of those initial themes, vision and goals accurately reflect the input that we received. And we'll also dive deeper on specific ideas, action steps um, for this new model. The strategy will be community forums, likely virtual, um, including multi-ward sessions and community specific sessions. And again, we'll be focused on working with people who have specialty and knowledge on engagement expertise so that we can um, reach the broadest base of people possible. The, deliver the deliverables of that would be a summary of those themes, as well as draft recommendations of action steps to realize a vision and a goal. Next slide, please. And the third phase will be community refinement. We feel like, again, it's very important to have a volleying back and forth between um, city staff and others working on this project and the community to make sure that we're capturing the information and reflecting it back to the community so that they can vet that what we're saying is in fact their words, their vision. So we'll collect feedback on the draft recommendations. Our strategies will be community forums, again, multi-ward sessions, community specific sessions, um, we'll do web based opportunities for review and comment as well as some additional strategies as re requested or encouraged by engagement experts. The, deliver the deliverables will be a compilation of feedback and input from community vision on the vision goals and action steps. Next slide please. And phase four will be um, June and July of 2021. The purpose again will be refining and finalizing recommendations. The strategy will be to review and incorporate community feedback on draft recommendations collected during phase three and the deliverables deliverables will be a final report to council on the strategy for building a new model of cultivating community safety. Next slide please. We do know that there will be some resource needs around the rollout and making sure that these um, phases are actually are able to be actualized. We believe that we'll need support around research and evaluation, um, things like survey design, question design, engagement activity design, synthesis, analysis, and writing. Um, all of those things need to be done in a way that is rooted in you know, the way that research and evaluation um, experts can develop them. We wanna make sure that we're using a high quality approach. And so we'll need research and evaluation experts on this particular part of the project. We'll also need support around project management. We wanna make sure that we um, stay on our timeline as it's been listed in the project. We wanna monitor our reporting and our progress. We wanna to continue to stay um, in a planning sequence and that we're actually tracking in the direction towards outcomes um, that lead us to a coordinated communication with community as well as with our policymakers. So community engagement support is another resource need. We know that as we do these surveys and engagement sessions, it will be important to have facilitators that can engage. We'll also need connections to communities of focus. Um, we recognize that we have a wide range of diversity within our city and we wanna make sure that they are being reached um, by people from within their own communities whenever it's possible. And so community engagement will be really important and promotion and communication of these engagement opportunities, again, in culturally and linguistically specific ways will be very important. Communication support, so promotion and communication of these engagement opportunities and keeping the community apprised of the progress along the way. We know that we wanna be as transparent as possible and create opportunities for the community to learn about all of the various phases and where we're at in the progress as we begin the process. 
um, IT and web support services, so assisting with making engagement opportunities on the web accessible and having a web presence for keeping the community apprised of all of the updates and where we're at in the process. And then again, that content expertise will be really important on a wide range of issues, but we're particularly thinking about police reform, violence prevention, 911 alternatives um, as being really important subject matter that we'll want content expertise on. And so we know that we have some internal city experts on some of this subject matter. We'll also be looking to external local experts and national experts. As mentioned in the slide before, there have already been some tables of local experts and national experts that are being uh, included in this process so that we will have that expertise at the table, but we will need to work on resourcing them to make sure that they're able to participate through the duration of the process. Next slide, please. Thank you. That concludes the formal presentation. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions about the presentation from Council at this time. Thank you so Thank much, you so Director Cotton. Uh, uh, I would like to um, first uh, open it up to uh, Council President Bender, followed by Kano and then Gordon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't serve on the committee, but I'm um, grateful to be here today. And I really just wanted to thank all of the staff from across the enterprise that really contributed to this recommendation for a timeline um, for the reimagining public safety community engagement and decision making process um, ahead. And, you know, I know we all um, um, heard in the last presentation from staff some um, um, you know feedback about how about the timeline um, that we had initially asked for from staff to bring a presentation related to community engagement and our decision making timeline. I know that um, I was hopeful that we could get the work started to engage our community more quickly than we have. Um, and I have spent the last few weeks talking with you, Mr. Chair, and the um, members of this committee with Mayor Fry and his staff, with the different department heads that were um, named in our resolution back on June 12th, and really have come to understand that the way that we need to staff this work still isn't quite there. And so we've asked many staff across the enterprise to um, dedicate a small part of their time to this effort and it clearly needs its own dedicated staff, more clarity about the different roles and responsibilities. So um, today we have before the committee a specific course of action that staff is looking for direction to uh, approve this basic approach to community engagement and decision making over the next year. I want you to know and my colleagues on the committee as well as staff that I'm continuing conversations with our city coordinator, Mark Ruff, our health commissioner, um, commissioner, our commissioner of health, who I want to call director Gretchen Musicant, you know, our budget office, the mayor and, and you, my colleagues, about how we can um, staff and resource this initiative adequately uh, so that our staff are supported well. Um, so again, thank you to the staff who, who put this together on top of the many other things that they are already doing. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, happy to be here for this part of the meeting. If anyone has any questions about how we got here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, thank you for being here and thank you for all your hard work. Um, I will just um, briefly add um, my, how grateful that I am to you, Director Cotton, for your leadership um, in getting this, uh, pulling this together. This has been a, a lot of work um, and, a, and a heavy lift, so I'm very grateful for you um, and, and all the work that you've done to organize uh, what we see here today uh, before the Council that for action. Um, next up, we have Councilmember Cano followed by Councilmember Gordon. Councilmember Cano, you still may be muted. Yes, thank you. Okay. I yeah. appreciate that. Okay, um, so thank you so much for this presentation, uh, Director Cotton. Um, just to contextualize, about four months ago, nine council members um, took the stage at Powderhorn Park and talked about the limitations of reform in redeeming our current policing systems. And then um, we made a commitment to begin the process 
of um, reimagining our current policing system and creating a new transformative model that could cultivate public safety. And we committed to that uh, year long engagement process and um, in working with our community members as well as um, discussed taking immediate action steps to get us on that path. Um, I feel confident that we are on that path. Um, I, I was asked recently by some uh, media whether uh, I regretted making those statements four months ago, and I said absolutely not. Um, in retrospect, however, um, what I do regret is not having a clear uh, commitment and agreement with our community members about the alternative safety models that we would have to immediately operationalize to support our communities. And so for all the cities and all the other people listening to this conversation today and, and in future days um, as this is taped and made available on YouTube, I, I do encourage um, everyone that's uh, watching Minneapolis and observing how we uh, handle the, um, the challenge before us and the opportunity as well um, to, do, to do good for our community and to make a long lasting change that will live through generations uh, I advise them to have a presentation like this years before they decide to end their policing system. And so um, the, the only real regret I have is, is not doubling down on efforts like this with uh, departments like yours uh, or divisions like yours, Sasha, uh, Director Cotton, to, um, to get these systems up and running before the big uh, changes um, were committed to. So, so I'm, I'm grateful that this work continues to move forward and um, I, I appreciate the lessons learned from the last four months and I, I only uh, wish the best for our city to, to figure this out because so many people are, have been suffering in the past and are certainly um, living through very challenging times now. So my question is twofold. One is related to the, um, the brilliant cultural connections and relationships that exist within the Neighborhood and Community Relations Department, which is a department that, again, is a legacy department for Minneapolis. Um, not a lot of cities have a department like that uh, through the funded mechanisms that the city of Minneapolis has. And I, I have high respect for people like Christine McDonald, who is uh, completely connected to and plugged into every American Indian and indigenous group and organization in the Twin Cities area, as well as Mariano Espinosa, who's the Latino liaison and has been able to feed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Latino families every Friday at Powderhorn Park through a partnership with um, a few food justice organizations. And so I'm, I'm curious about like what the relationship will be uh, of this work between your office and NCR, uh, primarily because I don't want that um, those relationships and that social capital and those years worth of investment, both in money and staff time, as well as community trust that has been built there to to sort of be chucked to the side and be like, well, you know, they're not part of this new sexy thing. So like, who cares? Um, so I would love to hear more about the nuance of the relationship of how we carry this work forward as an enterprise leaning on reputable departments like NCR and their cultural staff, which is very diverse. Uh, you know, they have East African folks on their staff, Latino folks, indigenous folks, African American folks, um, and, and I wouldn't want to, um, you know, see them um, not uh, leveraged or integrated in, a, in an authentic and meaningful way as we develop um, this, uh, this work moving forward. So if you could just speak to that for a little bit, I would really appreciate it. Yes, thank you for the question, uh, Council Member Cano and uh, Chair Cunningham. We are certainly, it would be nothing, nothing would make me happier than to have all of the cultural liaisons from uh, Neighborhood and Community Relations working on this project full time, because I do think that it's really important that we're gathering uh, perspectives from the diversity of our city in a way that is authentic and is connected not just to the city, but to people from those respective communities who speak that language and know the cultural norms and can ask the questions that need to be asked in a way that meets those cultural needs. So we are working very intentionally on trying to get NCR um, staff on this project. That being said, across the enterprise, everybody has work that they're focused on and it's really difficult to, to um, 
commit staff. And so I know that our department head is talking with the coordinator's office and NCR leadership about what time they're able to commit to the project, but it is certainly top of mind for us to have them participating in whatever way they possibly can. Thank you, Director. And, and I did speak to Director Rubador about this a few weeks ago, and, and we had a brief conversation about how we as a city um, are probably going to have to decide uh, which which pieces of work is a priority for us and, and which can be deferred by a year or two pending the coronavirus uh, economic uh, deficit as well as the the priority to to really solve this uh, safety issue. So I am very open to hearing from city directors about the type of work that we should defer uh, or put on the back burner for uh, a while so we can really uh, deliver strongly on this front and, and connect this uh, topic of public safety to what Councilmember Goodman had mentioned earlier regarding economic development and sustainability and resilience for our city. So I think it would um, be really smart for us to have a, a real clear conversation about the things we can put um, aside for a year or two to support this work and, and ensure that our best talent and um, already uh, built up internal assets can be deployed into this line of work. My next question is related to Hennepin County. So um, I know that we as a city are really proud of the health I'm, department. I'm sorry, Council Member Cano, um, just to that first question, it seemed that Council um, President Bender had a specific um, component of that um, to be able to uh, add to that answer from um, Director Cotton. So President Bender, did you want to speak to that? Because I know you've been having a lot of conversations and then Council Member Cano will bounce back to you. And I just want to remind folks that uh, Director Cotton has to get out of here by uh, 2.20 due to a scheduling conflict. So. Um, so just want to make sure that we're, we're addressing that. So uh, Council President Bender, then we'll hop back to you, Council Member Cano. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Council Member Cano, for raising that. I, I had a great conversation with Director Rubador yesterday and have been talking with um, Mark Ruff, who ultimately um, directs that department of the coordinator's office, which NCR resides in. Um, so we have, I think, a clear understanding and recognition from all of the department heads that this work um, needs more resources. Director Rubador had been planning to put staff time to this, had started to figure out exactly what that looked like and what other things may need to be delayed. I do think in the next week we need to get to a more clear structure of staff and a more, um, you know, he, we need to hear as policymakers if there are particular budget things that need to change. I've had many good conversations with the mayor's office as well. Um, so I think we're almost there. I just wanted you to know uh, I'm really glad you raised the question about NCR and they are um, they will need to be fully a part of this. Um, I think they recognize it. A lot of these things come back to resources and priorities, as you said yourself, Councilor. Thank you, Council uh, President Bender, and uh, thank you, Council Member Cano, for the great points you brought up. Uh, if you'd like to continue with your second question. Uh, yes. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Chair. So, uh, Director Cotton, you know, there's this oftentimes this notion that the city of Minneapolis should go at it alone and it's our problem and we need to figure out how to get ourselves out of the hole. Um, but again, I don't see it as a, as a problem uh, more than an opportunity to really do, do good by our community. So curious about your thinking regarding leveraging uh, Hennepin County resources. I'm less familiar with how the state would fit into this. And, and then, of course, we have that big um, uh, process that we're in with uh, with the um, uh, Commissioner Lucero's department. But taking it back, um, is there is there a room or space for us to really tap into Hennepin County resources, programs, staff or initiatives that can both relieve some of the pressure that we're feeling um, around this conversation because of the um, the various uh, scenarios that our communities are facing and and more directly, um, is there a role for them in this process um, as we engage our city um, in this conversation? Yes, thank you for the question, Councilperson Cano, uh, Mr. Chair. I, you know, I think that's that's a great call um, as it pertains to the current structure at the work group level and the local expert level. We have invited both county staff and state staff, as well as folks from Metro Transit uh, Police Department 
and others to participate at those levels because obviously Minneapolis sits within Hennepin County and it's important that we're looking cross jurisdictionally at this issue and what resources um, we can bring to bear outside of just our city. I would be certainly open if there are suggestions from the council or others on ways that we could pull um, the county in in different ways than we already have. But I think that's a great idea to keep them in mind of how they could contribute. I think we should definitely explore that and, and really um, try to establish um, a strong line of work with them uh, on this front. So thank you. I will allow um, my other colleagues to ask more questions. I have a, a three other things, but I'll, I'll just um, send you an email and we can chat later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Cano. Great questions. Next up, we have Councilmember Gordon, followed by uh, Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Cunningham, and also thanks for this um, plan and this report. This is really exciting to see come forward. Um, I would um, be happy to move it um, for approval, and I think the action that was proposed is approving the Community Safety and Engagement Plan, and if you'll allow me, I'll, I'll move that. I think this is a great start and it's a really big important step that we should take. I will note that I think there's more work that has to be done along with this and my understanding is some of that is being developed. This would include a larger kind of um, reconciliation process and and um, restorative or transformative um, justice process that's also called out and my understanding is that staff and um, some of my colleagues including the vice president of the council are working on this. Um, so I think that that's excellent. I also um, feel a little bit like this is incomplete here, like we could use a staff direction with really good clarity, but hearing from the council president, I understand that might be something that could even come later and I'm not prepared to make a staff direction right now. I'm, I'm prepared to say that my intent and encouragement would be for staff to rally around this and implement it well and also for us to look carefully at the budget because I think what's obvious, especially when you look at all the resources needed, is we may need some outside help and expertise and we may want to make an investment in that going forward. So I think as we're scrutinizing the mayor's proposed budget and what our needs are to make sure that this plan can be as successful and complete as possible, you know, we're going to have to look carefully at what kind of amendments might need to be made so that we can do that because um, I think it, it would probably yield us a much better plan and also allow us to keep moving forward with all the other great work that we need to do as a city um, if we had some help on a contract basis um, from the outside. Those are my comments um, and I don't think I don't think there's a dollar figure that anybody's ready to put on it, which was the question that I would be tempted to give to um, Ms. Cotton, but I'll just leave it with those comments for now. Thank you so much and um, making the motion. So we, um, Council Member Gordon has made a motion to approve an engagement plan outline and deliverables related to transforming community safety. Um, I will uh, open it up for discussion related to the, the motion. Um, I'm assuming that the folks in, in uh, queue are going to speak to that as well. Um, I do just want to share um, that within my role, um, I, I am echoing um, Council President Bender's request and call for uh, more broadly for uh, city department leaders and staff to really rally around fulfilling the staffing and resource needs related to this work. Um, and, you know, we really want to follow the lead uh, and leadership of um, city staff and there really is urgency for us to move on this work, so I look forward to it. I also do want to name that um, if this is not addressed by the end of next week, that there will I will be bringing forward a staff direction with uh, more clarity. Um, but I would rather us create space um, for the work um, for us to be able to uh, figure out the best structure together. So um, there, but there is urgency. We got so we got to keep it moving. Um, with that, um, next up we have Council Member Fletcher and uh, then followed by Council Member Palmasano. Thank you, Chair Cunningham. Um, and thank you, uh, Director Cotton, for this presentation. I think what we have here really is the ingredients for exactly the project that we were looking for and I think exactly what the resolution really called for. So I appreciate the structure coming together. I think we are going to be sort of up against uh, the challenges of 
uh, this work, which is that it's it's coming later than people had hoped because uh, it kind of got stuck over the summer. And, and I think we need to just kind of acknowledge that, that, that right now, one of the ways that people are coming to it, and in addition to the, um, you know, the, the it, it experiences of trauma and anxiety and, and uh, you know, sort of strong feelings that everybody has around this is a sense of impatience. And so I think that uh, until we get this process up and running in a way that people feel like they can see and touch and trust, uh, there's going to be a little bit of that uh, anxiety as a part of the way people respond to the presentation. But I will just say that the content here is what we were looking for. You are on the right track. And I want to just really give that feedback that this is this is a really positive step forward. Uh, this is something I'm happy to support and that I really hope uh, and I just want to echo what uh, all of my colleagues have said, which is we need to figure out how to support this. Uh, we are looking for city staff across the enterprise to step up and support this in all of the ways that they can to like I want you to hear from as many council members as possible that this is a huge priority of the enterprise right now like that this is what the city is doing uh, is engaging the public on this really important question that is kind of the only thing people are talking about so we really need to make sure that this is uh, a huge huge uh, focus and priority and and a place that everybody's putting their energy where it's called for. Uh, we're also really counting on you to come to us quickly when you find that you need clarity, when you find that you need resources. Uh, make sure that if there are places that you're getting bogged down because you need feedback from us, that, that we know that and can give you that feedback in a really timely way so that we can keep things moving along. Because uh, I know that there are challenges in moving something this big and this ambitious forward, but I really just uh, want to recognize what a positive step forward this is and what a real uh, sense of alignment I'm feeling between what we asked for in June and uh, what we're seeing in this presentation. So thank you. Um, and I would just ask, are there things that you can see right away that we can do to support this effort? Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Vice Chair Fletcher. I appreciate the comments and questions. First, I want to uh, just state that while this presentation is being given by me, countless hours of staff time from both the Office of Violence Prevention, the Coordinator's Office, the Mayor's Office staff has gone into sort of developing the structure and giving thoughts to how we can move this work forward. So I want to acknowledge all of the hard work that has gone in from across the enterprise to getting us to where we are. I think as far as thinking about uh, next steps and what we're going to need, there's definitely need for the things that we listed in that resource and I, whether we find them throughout the enterprise or in outside ways, although I'll be candid in saying I think we can be more expeditious by finding them internally right now because of all of the layers of bureaucracy we have to go through to move a contract with an outside entity. Um, it, it is the staff time that is a huge burden. Um, we know that city staff have responsibilities and are doing work feverishly across the enterprise as they're assigned and so freeing up some time for staff to focus on this is going to be a crucial part of getting the work done. Great, thank you so much. Um, and then uh, we will wrap up with, um, it looks like the last person up is um, Councilmember Palmasano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Cotton, thank you for this presentation. Um, I'm curious, and apologize if if you gave it some mention as you were going through the slides, but it wasn't in your slides specifically. How will existing, how will our existing MPD be engaged or will they be engaged in transforming this public safety plan? I, I want to be very sensitive to people who wouldn't want them engaged, but also balance that with the fact that they have a lot of experience to offer. Um, yes, this is a top priority, and I worry that engaging people here kind of jumps ahead of our current reality, and people are kind of trying to deal with our current reality. So um, if, if there isn't a plan to work with or engage MPD in, as we move forward, have you gotten any input from Chief Arredondo on this plan, or would you? Yes, thank you for the question, uh, Sir Chair and Councilperson Pomisano. We certainly intend to include law enforcement in the conversation, particularly as we think about policy and reform changes to the existing MPD. And so in the work group structure, there is a work group specifically focused on police reform, 
as we know, up until this point, the mayor's office has led a lot of that work. We're really looking at how we can have one cohesive plan that speaks to all of this and looks at a broad-based way to come about, come up with strategies that are informed by our community, internal stakeholders, including the police department, as well as national and local experts, both some working in law enforcement, some with past experience in law enforcement, and others who may have very different ideas about law enforcement in order to get a full picture of where we need to go on this issue. And so there is no intention here to exclude conversations about police reform and policy change or procedure change. We know that um, per Minnesota state statute, we have to have a police response at a bare minimum to domestic violence calls and gun violence. And so figuring out what all of that looks like is certainly something that we are thinking about as a part of this process. Thank you. Great, thank you so much uh, to my colleagues for those questions. Um, great discussion and points brought up. Uh, thank you again to Director Cotton uh, to echo what I um, heard from uh, my colleague, Vice Chair Fletcher. This really feels an alignment with what we brought forward, the expectations that we brought forward um, in June. So thank you very, very much uh, for, for bringing this forward. And I look forward to the next steps of how we as a city will align to operationalize tangibly what we have talked about here and keep things on track. So the staffing and the resource needs, we as an entire city organization need to come together and figure out how we are going to build that infrastructure. To Council Member Cano's point, there's going to be some work that we have to say this needs to wait. We have to we have to push this back a little bit because this is a an incredibly pressing urgent need for our city to be able to create lasting sustainable peace and uh, and safety in our city. So um, I'm grateful uh, for you to be here, Director Cotton. I know that this was a challenging scheduling conflict for you, so thank you for your flexibility and being here. Um, and seeing no uh, further questions or comments, uh, the motion again on the table from Councilmember Gordon is approving an engagement plan outline and deliverables related to transforming community safety. And uh, Clerk, will you please call, call the roll? Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Chair Cunningham. Aye. There are six ayes. Great, um, that carries and that recommendation will be referred to the city council meeting next Friday for final action. Thank you again to all of the city staff for their hard work um, in, in getting this work up and rolling. So now colleagues, we will be moving uh, back to our agenda. Um, we have a public hearing and um, five consent agenda items. We will first start with the um, public hearing, um, which is a public hearing on the food catering ordinance. Uh, we'll now begin with a staff presentation, which I believe will be given by, I think we said Ken was gonna be doing it, my apologies, um, but we will now turn it over to the city staff responsible for uh, bringing this forward before council. Thank you. Oh, Kevin, my apologies. <laughs> Good afternoon and thank you, Chair Cunningham and uh, council members. Uh, my name is Kevin Gepperson and I'm a supervisor with the Minneapolis Health Department. The ordinance change I'm uh, talking about today grew out of Minneapolis businesses looking for creative ways to provide food for their employees, tenants, and guests. With Council Member Johnson's support, the amendment to the caterer license definition will provide greater opportunities for Minneapolis businesses. The Minnesota Food Code currently does not allow caterers to sell I meals directly to individuals. My apologies. Um, Hi, everybody. If we could please make sure that's muted. Sorry about that, Kevin. If you could keep on going. Thank you. This change to the caterer definition will allow caterers to sell individual meals directly to employees, tenants, and guests. Because the city has delegation agreements with both Minnesota Department of Health 
and Minnesota Department of Agriculture, we were required to go through a re review and approval process um, with them prior to bringing our proposed changes forward. There are three ordinances, ordinances changes in front of you, and I'm going to talk about the second one, which is MCO 186.50. At now, as I mentioned, this ordinance change will provide opportunities for many licensed caterers. Businesses will be able to bring licensed caterers to sell directly to their employees, tenants, and guests with some restrictions. Uh, some of these restrictions are they cannot be open to the general public, food cannot be prepared or cooked on site, and a hand washing station must be provided. Um, there is a distinction between caterers who are delegated by Minnesota Department of Health and Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Now I will go back to, um, to talk about the first ordinance, which is 186.30. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, businesses such as grocery stores and convenience stores that operate under uh, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture cannot be able to take advantage of this opportunity. Uh, this is because Minnesota Department of Agriculture in their delegation agreement does not allow the city to be more or less restrictive than the Minnesota Food Code. And this modification to the ordinance will be less restrictive than the Minnesota Food Code. Uh, texts have been added to acknowledge this restriction in Ordinance 186.30. Next slide, please. Now the good news is most licensed caterers and restaurants with catering licenses are delegated by uh, Minnesota Department of Health, so they are able to take advantage of this change. Now this very last slide here um, is the final proposed change is to Ordinance 188.10, and this proposed change is just a tax cleanup um, according with Minnesota Department of Agriculture delegation agreement. Now the alignment was proposed after the recent assessment of the city's health um, inspection program. Next slide, please. Now that concludes my uh, short presentation. Uh, thank you, Chair Cunningham, council members and viewers. Um, thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you, Mr. Kilprasuf. I appreciate you very much. Um, and so now we will be moving to um, the public hearing related to this item. Um, I want to first clarify um, that this particular public hearing is related to the amendments being brought forward to the food catering ordinance. Um, I believe that there was um, a misunderstanding um, in the transition from the Public Safety and Emergency Management Committee to now this Public Health and Safety Committee. Our public hearings are connected to specific legislative items. Um, I know that quite a few, few folks signed up to speak broad, more broadly related to public safety. Um, and so um, what we are uh, going to do in order to um, address this, um, this disconnect is that um, I am going to be um, here and now I, I am announcing and directing the city clerk to um, to give notice for a public hearing for October 8th at 1 30 p.m. related to uh, policing concerns. Um, it is important uh, for us to give public notice to ensure that every resident who is interested in speaking to the item um, I'm sorry, instead of public hearing, please, uh, it's a public comment, my apologies. Um, uh, we wanna give public notice to having um, opportunities to speak before the council so that uh, folks, anybody who's interested in, in participating in that public comment period um, has the ability to do so. Um, and that aligns by having the public notice of a public hearing uh, or public comment period, um, it, it aligns with the council's adopted rules related to public hearings and comment periods. Um, so with that being stated, I do also want to um, kick it over to um, our city clerk, uh, Casey Carl, um, so that he can give uh, any additional comments related to uh, today's public hearing and the procedures related to public hearings and public comments. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just add briefly to what you said that the Minnesota open meeting law requires that notices be given at least three days before a meeting. We always include those notices with the published agenda. We also publish those separately on LIMS. They're published in finance and commerce for broader public awareness and access. As you noted, the reason the law is written that way is so that all interested parties have the opportunity to participate in matters in front of the city council, hearings uh, which are required under certain state laws or charter provisions or uh, discretionary public comment periods where at the discretion of the council and the committees, we provide those notices so that there is fair, accessible and transparent process open to everyone. The registration form that allows folks to sign up does allow an open field for people to identify what on the agenda they're speaking about. Um, and so that is, I believe, what led to the confusion. I did confirm with the technical team that there was never listed on this agenda or on our registration sign up form a quote public comment, open public comment forum. Um, and so the, the confusion is probably based on the fact that, as you noted, there's a difference between those committees, um, but the Public Safety and Emergency Management Committee's last meeting was March 18th, and in six months we have not had uh, any of those public comment periods. So uh, appreciate the direction and happy to schedule a public comment period on the matter of uh, po policing, as you indicated, for the next committee meeting, which would be on Thursday, October 8th at 1.30 p.m. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I appreciate it. So um, to clarify, as I open this public hearing, if you are here today um, to speak sp outside of something related to the ordinance related to food catering, um, then we ask for you and you're interested in speaking to policing issues um, then in public safety. We ask for you to please uh, sign up when it is publicly noticed uh, for that October 8th meeting. Um, that is so again, this public hearing is related to this food catering ordinance. Um, we so far actually do not have anyone signed up um, to speak to the specific item. We do have quite a few folks on the line. Um, and so I, I will go through the list. Um, if you are here again to speak to um, something not related uh, to the food catering ordinance to please um, uh, delay, uh, pause your comments. Um, you are free to also uh, do so um, to submit your comments to council comment at MinneapolisMN.gov con and, and or contact the mayor's office and city council off your city council member and uh, we will be having a public hearing on October 8th. Um, great with that um, I will open up the public hearing um, as I call your name if you could um, I'm sorry, please hold one moment. I, I'm sorry, Ms. Mr. Carl, um, can, can, can you please speak to that? I'm sorry. Certainly, Mr. Chair, and I'm sorry to uh, provide more confusion in an already stressful situation. But for those who had already signed up to speak about general uh, policing issues or public safety, uh, I'm happy to have our office reach out to them and put them back in queue for the October 8th meeting uh, per your direction with the public comment period so that they're first in line and available to speak at that time. Oh, perfect. Great. So, um, so, so just to make sure folks understand if you signed up today um, and you wanted to speak to to public safety and policing, you will be added to the queue for the public hearing. Um, so you will not have to go through that additional step. Did I did I capture that correctly, Mr. Clerk? Yes, for the public comment period. Yeah, for the public comment period. Thank you so much. All right, so um, I will go ahead and um, begin down the list. Um, if you could uh, unmute yourself by pushing star six um, and stating your name for the record as well as um, what you're here to speak to. So uh, first on our list today um, is Bill Rodriguez. Councilor Cunningham, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Mr. Cunningham, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Sir, by your own um, uh, discussion just now, there's apparently been quite a bit of confusion and miscommunication 
on the part of your staff and your team. I, like many others on the phone here, uh, signed up well in advance of this meeting to speak about the number one concern in this community right now, and that's our public safety. And I move for you to suspend the rules as you are in every right to do. We signed up in good faith. We followed the rules. We spoke to staff well in advance of this meeting to make sure we had followed the rules correctly. And so therefore, I think it would be courteous of you and within your responsibility to hear what the taxpayers, your people who pay your salary have to say about our concerns currently regarding public safety in our community. Mr. I Rodriguez, wait two as, more weeks. I don't think we I should wait two more weeks to have to voice concerns and solutions for the number one public safety issue facing our community today. If the house is burning, you put out the fire now. Mr. You don't Rodriguez, go putting it off this for two weeks and saying, we'll get to you later. To the food catering ordinance, that is what is open Sir, right now. And so as Sir, we have your stated- meeting on the website, your meeting on the website indicated there was a public hearing today. No agenda was published until two days prior. It was impossible for an average citizen to go onto your site before two days ago and understand clearly what was on the agenda. Mr. Rodriguez, we this public hearing is related to the food catering ordinance. Um, and I if, am explaining to you why you Mr. should- Mr. Carl, is there anything else that you would like to add for clarification? Because um, it, there, there seems to be the statement that staff have said that there is an open comment yes. period. Could you please speak to this? And Mr. Rodriguez, please pause so that we can Thank have you. a response. Mr. Chair, I can confirm I have provided to the council an image in your chat that shows how people can sign up. It does say meetings with public hearings. It has a drop down menu that lists the dates and meetings that have hearings, not public comment periods. It also requires someone to type in the agenda item. It says as an instruction, please include a file number or the agenda item so we can know what you're speaking about. Um, what Mr. Rodriguez did was he typed into that field public safety. That was not an option yes. on the agenda. He typed it in. Uh, so, so this is not in keeping with signing up to speak about an agenda item. It's it's essentially adding an agenda item uh, that was not on the agenda so that speaking can be done. The uh, notices that were published on our website and in Finance and Commerce indicated that at today's meeting, there would be a public hearing at 1.30 before the Public Health and Safety Committee about the food catering ordinance and a link to that item, to that file in the legislative information management system dealing with the food catering ordinance was provided. So the item that uh, he, the speaker is uh, addressing, which is general public safety, was not included on our official public notices page. It was not published in finance and commerce. There was not an equal or uh, balanced opportunity for anyone in the community to come speak to this. Uh, and adding in a comment that's not on the agenda uh, is not necessarily the way to uh, be able to address what's happening. Uh, the tech team are showing you the sign up form right now. As you can see where it says agenda item, this is a field that's required to be filled out so that we can identify which uh, item speakers are signing up to speak about. And so uh, this would say, as it says, click here to follow the link to see what items are on the agenda and either give us the agenda item number or give us the legislative file number so that we can put you in queue. Uh, never was the I item called general public safety. And I do understand because I have seen uh, the form filled out by Mr. Rodriguez that it came through. He typed that into a blank field that that's not necessarily meaning it's on the agenda. I, and I understand you've asked us to add a public comment period to the next committee meeting and we can certainly do that. And then at that time we would add that to the agenda and put it on the public kind of uh, public comment sign up form so that anyone who's interested could certainly at that time speak to that item. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. So um, I Mr. would like Cunningham, to, Mr. Cunningham, Mr. Rodriguez, when we, when we please called, pause. we called about. Go ahead, sir. I just wanted to again state that one of the important reasons as to why we do public notices so that everyone is aware of a public hearing or a public comment period is so that everyone who would like to be able to have a voice in the process um, at that meeting has the ability to do so. So if we suspend our rules as a committee to be able to have folks speak to an item that is not related to an agenda item, then that is not transparent and fair to other folks who would like to be able to speak to the specific uh, the specific item that you would like to speak to. That does That is not a reflection of not feeling that this is urgent or 
more a priority. Uh, I 100% agree with you. This is something, it's a top priority we need to be talking about. Um, and the rules of the council when it comes to this is that we want to be able to have as transparent and fair accessible process for folks, which is why I, upon seeing and hearing about the uh, list of folks who would like to be able to speak to this issue, have announced officially for there to be a we public comment period that. related mm -hmm. to October, uh, or excuse me, on October 8th um, at the next committee meeting so that we can have a fair, transparent, accessible uh, process so that other folks who are interested in speaking to this issue have the space to do so as well. So, um, so I just wanted to Mr. Um, that. Mr. Cunningham, Mr. Cunningham, there is nothing unfair, so to speak, to allow the many people, the many people who have signed up to speak today, to allow them to speak and still be able to hear additional people two weeks from now when this crisis we're facing will be two weeks deeper into our lives. What the clerk said was only partially correct. We did Mr. Call. Rodriguez, the we public call, hearing sir. that we are going to have is on October 8th at 1.30. That is going to be the public, that's going to be the public comment period so that we can have a fair process. This, the sir, public hearing for today is related us to, down today. No, because that, this was outside of the process. Shutting us down today. Sir, Mr. Rodriguez, what your clerk described, the process your, your clerk described, what is the process just for so that you're aware. Navigate this at this point? Sir, the clerk did not finish the story. We called directly. This is not Hall related to, to the public hearing that we are having right now. The public hearing that I have opened is related to the food. Sir, it ordinance. is your if you would like to speak to that, to hear what then you can do that. Have to say right now you are absolutely free concern. to send an email to the to no, any sir, council member to, to be able to do and that. Phone calls and you do sir, not reply this to any of them, which is why we're showing up here to today. Food catering ordinance. Sir, why don't you poll your team right now and see how many of them are willing to suspend the rules and let us speak right now. Why don't you go ahead and poll your team right now and see if everybody is in agreement with you. Sir, I am the chair uh, of this uh, committee uh, and so therefore if, if one of my colleagues would like to be able to bring a motion, we can vote on that motion. However, Very well. this or what is open right now is a public hearing related to the food catering ordinance. That is what this public hearing is right now that has been opened. Well, sir, you have so, the opportunity to oh stop right now and ask for a motion. I, so I, I, really, I, I really do not want to do this back and forth. This public hearing is related but to the food catering ordinance. Ask for I will motion, not ask for a motion be because that's not, that's not, that's not, be one of my fair. Be fair to us, sir, and ask for a motion. You know this is the number one concern on oh, everybody's mind uh, right now. I'm sorry to my colleagues. I I just be able to uh, just saw in the the queue. Um, Councilmember Palmasano, my apologies um, for for not seeing you. Um, I, actually, let me pause right quick. Um, Mr. Carl, we are in a public. I've opened a public hearing. Um, now I have council members in queue. How should I close the public hearing? Suspend it? What what recommendation do you have procedurally? Mr. Chair, I would recommend that if you're moving away from this item, you recess this public hearing that's already been opened so that any other business that may come before the committee can be uh, considered at this time. OK, so um, do I just suspend it for? Yep. You time? would just say without objection, I'm recessing the public hearing and then you can recognize Councilmember Palmasano. Thank you. I just want to make sure I'm following appropriate procedures. Um, so uh, I will um, recess this public hearing, um, but uh, I have Council Member Palmasano in queue. So Council Member Palmasano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was going to try to be helpful here and recommend that we dispose with the catering ordinance public hearing first, um, but I do think we need to address this um, from the things that I have seen. Um, you know, the clerk says that online sign up requires identification of public hearings and, and he's right. Um, that makes sense as to why people who had signed up weeks ago weren't allowed to sign up for our previous meeting. Uh, the fact is this whole system of virtual participation is new to everybody. Um, I fear that for many of these folks, this could be the first time they've ever 
participated in committee proceedings and everything is different now. Um, I, I don't know. I haven't heard from the clerk's office exactly how many people have signed up, except we can see how many people are here right now. So I just want to acknowledge that people here on this call may be due to confusion, but we should appreciate this. Um, you know, we should appreciate that fact um, that for two plus years we've had public comment periods on matters of public safety at the Public Safety Committee. So ironically, our main discussion item today from Director Cotton was about how to meaningfully engage the public in a public safety conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I would suggest or support first trying to let those that have joined the call today to actually speak, knowing that that means suspending our council rules to do so. I would suggest that we clear this queue, but I respect the chair in this environment and it sounds as though, and I want to repeat, that you have committed to at our next regular meeting a one-time space to offer public comments on matters of public safety. That Thanks. is correct. I, I have done so. Um, and um, I have Councilmember Gordon in queue. Uh, thank you, and I um, respected the chair's decision about this. I guess it's re regrettable if people actually mistakenly thought that they could speak more generally today on this topic. Um, I, that's a confusion, I guess I can appreciate might be authentically, uh, might really have happened to some folks. Um, I'm, I wasn't on the public safety committee during the period when they were taking public comment at the beginning, but I did just wanted to raise another point that we risk um, being so flexible about suspending our rules that they're meaningless. And so that means we give this distinct advantage to people who are particularly assertive and can make their cases really well to get heard over and over and over and, and in an unfair way. Um, and so I'm concerned about that. And maybe maybe you think of it as precedent setting um, that, that um, if we're so flexible about that rule, well, we should change the rule um, and then open it up wide open for everybody, I guess, if we think that we should just be more flexible and impromptu at our committee meetings. So I am um, uh, um, just for those who were curious when I heard somebody should make the motion and I'm not going to make the motion to suspend suspend the rules, but I think I vote against it and support the chair and his decision this far. Thank you, Councilmember Gordon. Next up we have Ellison, Councilmember Ellison. Uh, I can't state it any better than Councilmember Gordon has. Uh, I think that, that early in the term, there were times where we did suspend the rules. And I think that for the past couple of years, the practice has been to not suspend the rules and allow folks to speak. And I can think of a number of occasions in which we've had relatively large groups. Uh, I remember one protest with regards to the Corcoran Five who showed up. I know that we've had a lot of folks who um, for years were um, asking us to make cuts to the police department well before the this larger national conversation would show up demanding to, to speak uh, and in those instances we did not suspend the rules there is a situation where uh, I think that the fair thing to do would would be to not suspend the rules uh, you you have given your intention to notice a, pub a public comment period for uh, the next meeting um, and uh, and so I think it, I think it's I think that is the appropriate approach. Um, but we can't suspend the rules every single time a group shows up. Um, and we haven't in the past, even when those groups have probably possibly agreed with our positions um, as individual council members or as chairs or, or, or anything. So this isn't necessarily about that. This is about uh, whether or not we're being fair to all groups. So uh, I respect the chair's decision. Thank you. Um, is there, um, are there any other comments from council members? All right, not seeing any. Um, Mr. Carl, um, how would you recommend that we proceed with uh, the public hearing since it seems as though no one who signed up is actually here to speak to this specific public hearing? Um, how Mr. would you Chair. recommend proceeding? Mr. Chair, so, sir, what we're saying is if you are engaged no, sir. citizen no, and Mr. Assertive, Rodriguez. we cannot no, Mr. speak. Rodriguez. Is that what you're saying? Because No. All right, go ahead, Mr. Mr. Carl. 
Mr. Chair, uh, you would first need to resume the public comment period, which was previously opened. As you know, we recessed that at your direction, so you would resume the public comment period. Hearing no public comments and having no one sign up to you in order to make Mr. Public Rodriguez, public this sir. is so, Mr. Rodriguez, I will ask for you to be taken out of the meeting if you continue to unmute yourself and speak out of turn. It is not appropriate. It is out of order. So sure. please stop speaking in the middle. Thank you. As you were saying, Mr. Carl. So once you resume that public hearing and you see that there is no one here to make comment or to offer testimony on right. the item we as noticed seen. to the public, then what you would do is close the public hearing and proceed as normal with entertaining a motion on that that proposed ordinance. All right. Um, all right, so then I will. Um, all right, so um, it, it does seem we Simply have. Simply reopen the public hearing. That's all you need to say. OK, I will uh, reopen this public hearing. Um, we have Council Member Johnson on the line um, who would like to speak to this. Um, if you just hang on one second, Council Member, um, if there is, is there anyone here to speak to this um, particular item? All right, hearing none, I will close this public hearing. Uh, Council Member Johnson. Uh, yes, Council sir. Member. Public safety. Okay, uh, Council Member Did Johnson. Um, let me see here right quick. Um, Um, Council Member Johnson keeps getting muted. I think he has called in, so give me one second. Um, so his his is two six three nine. Um, so if we could please not mute that, um, Council Member Johnson, um, if you would like to speak to this, uh, we welcome we welcome you to the committee. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, thanks. I don't know what's happening there. I was trying to unmute and it just kept saying, oh, you're somebody muted you. So uh, I just wanted to jump on uh, to the call though. And if any of my colleagues have questions, I'm happy to answer on this ordinance, but we've been working on it for quite a while. And, you know, it's definitely uh, something that is going to help support small businesses, uh, especially restaurants. It is of course, uh, with COVID, a little complicated in the sense that uh, they won't be able to benefit uh, as much right now with that challenge uh, as they would have pre-COVID. But certainly, as soon as COVID uh, eases up, this will be a really wonderful way for our, uh, especially independent local restaurants, to uh, expand their customer base and introduce themselves to additional people and uh, just be able to be more resilient. And it, it just works out uh, really well for a lot of uh, uh, folks. And so I'm really happy for staff's partnership on this and the conversations to get to this, uh, to get to this place with this. I think it's a, a really positive change to help our small businesses and uh, ask for my colleague's support on it, and I'm happy to answer any questions you all have. Thank you, Councilmember Johnson. Thank you for your leadership in this area. It's always a, 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 a win to be able to help set up small businesses to be able to have opportunities for revenue streams and to thrive. Um, I will now uh, open it up to see if there are any um, colleagues um, who have any questions. Um, yeah, to see if there are any questions related to this item. All right, seeing none, um, I will uh, move approval of this item. Are there any discuss? Is there any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, um, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion to approve. Councilmember Gordon, aye. Councilmember Cano. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Chair Cunningham. Aye. There are six ayes. 
thank you so much that that motion carries. Um, again, I would like to um, state that we will be having a public comment period scheduled for October 8th at 1.30 related to um, public safety and policing concerns. Um, this is um, to ensure that everyone who has the um, interest to be able to speak to the to this item has the ability to be at the public hearing related to that. Um, folks who have signed up to speak today will be able to uh, will be transferred over to that list. So we hope that you all will join us then. Uh, I apologize for any sort of um, confusion um, in this public health and safety committee. It is different than the public safety and emergency management committee. Um, and uh, so I just wanted to uh, clarify that given that that was the way that things were done before, now we have a public health and safety committee and um, we are operating under the council's rules. So um, it is not to disregard the urgency or the importance of talking about public safety. Um, we want to, it may seem boring, um, but we do need to adhere to the policies, procedures and rules of council committees to ensure that we have a transparent and fair process. Um, with that, uh, colleagues, we have five items for the um, on the consent agenda. Um, so item number two on the agenda is accepting a COVID-19 supplemental assistance to firefighters grant from FEMA in the amount of $301,500 for the purchase of per, per, uh, personal protective equipment. Item number three is accepting reimbursements from the Minnesota Board of Firefighter Training and Education in the amount of $83,200 for um, approved training conducted between July 1st of 2020 through June 30th, 2021. Um, I just want to briefly pause there and um, give a quick raise and praise to the uh, finance director of the Minneapolis Fire Department um, for his hard work in bringing these resources into our city and our fire department. Item number four is authorizing an agreement with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to host four associates from the Public Health Associates Program in the public, uh, the, Min the Min Minneapolis Health Department for a two year period. If my colleagues have not already done so, I highly recommend for you all to read through the RCA. Uh, we have some really remarkable people coming to uh, work for our city across a plethora of issues, ranging from COVID to um, opioids and HIV and the school-based clinics. Um, so it'd be great for you to get to know those um, associates who will be coming in. Item number five is authorizing a contract with City University of New York on behalf of John Jay College of Criminal Justice in the amount not to exceed 275,000 for ongoing strategic advising with the specific aims of supporting the core Minneapolis Group Violence Intervention GVI implementation team. Um, this is a long time relationship um, that we have with uh, John Jay and so I'm very grateful for this ongoing relationship so that we can continue to deepen and strengthen our GVI efforts. Um, and item number six is authorizing the one time transfer of $50,000 from the city attorney's office to the police department for the personnel cost for two grant funded community navigator positions. And I will just also uh, briefly state that these two positions, one is related to um, intimate partner violence and the other is related to LGBTQ rights um, or community as well as homeless um, homelessness issues. Um, these two folks who are community navigators, these are civilian positions. Their powerhouse is doing phenomenal work. I'm very grateful for their service to our city as well as to um, the residents of our city um, who benefit from their service. So, um, so I'm grateful to the city attorney's office to be able to help fill this gap related to the community navigator, uh, these two grant funded navigator positions. Um, with that, I will um, ask if there are um, is any discussion on the consent agenda or if there are any items that anyone would like to pull off for discussion? Council Member Fletcher. Uh, thank you, Chair Cunningham. I just want to uh, join. I don't need to pull anything for discussion, but I wanted to comment briefly and just uh, uh, join your comments and just really appreciating uh, the John Jay College work coming through. I remember us. Uh, 
getting that into the budget uh, in December last year, and uh, I'm happy to see that moving along. I think that's one of the ways that we're responding to uh, violence in our community, and it's uh, I'm appreciative of the, te the technical assistance that that represents. Uh, I also just want to really thank the city attorney's office for finding the resources and for taking the initiative to sort of offer resources to keep these uh, community navigator staffed. And I think that, you know, knowing that uh, that grant was going to uh, and 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 that we were probably going to lose those two positions uh, had they not intervened does make me wonder if they're supported and if if uh, MPD is the right place for those positions to live. It's a re it's really important work, um, but I think we are at risk of losing them if the city attorney's office hadn't intervened. And I think it's important for us to get to some place that uh, that we are prioritizing important community work that's happening. And uh, I do think that's something we should look at as we. Uh, move forward and are thinking about the future of public safety. So uh, I'll just note that. But in the meantime, uh, uh, grateful that we're able to keep these two uh, workers who uh, really are doing uh, significant community work. Thank you so much um, for your comments, Councilmember Fletcher. Are there any other questions, comments, um, or items that council members would like to pull from the agenda? All right, seeing none, I move approval. Um, I move approval of the consent agenda. And clerk, will you please call the roll? Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Chair Cunningham. Aye. There are six ayes. That carries and the consent agenda is approved. Um, I just want to take a quick moment to um, pause again and say um, thank you to all of the city staff. Um, this work that's being brought before council um, takes so much time and energy, um, innovation, um, intentionality, and we are very, very lucky to have these um, amazing staff bringing this work before us. Um, with that, um, without objection and no further business before this committee, I will, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>